Welcome everybody. We are in the midst of Africa Evidence Week. Um, it's an exciting week of showcasing stories from across the continent um, and uh, stories of evidence to action um, from all disciplines and uh, all sectors. And we've used the opportunity to launch um, the Department of Global Health webinar series at Stellenbosch University, focusing particularly on engagement and advocacy and stories that are propelling evidence to action. So I'd like to give you all a very, very warm welcome to today. Um, our focus for these webinars is really to uh, encourage and inspire researchers, um, particularly those within uh, university settings who are trying to influence policy and wanting to influence practice change, but are, are sometimes unsure where to start. And it can be intimidating, it can be foreign. However, increasing the increasing importance of knowledge translation to enhance evidence informed decision making is quickly becoming an important skill set amongst the research community. So in this webinar series over the next few months, we will be exploring how students, postdocs and faculty are pushing the boundaries as they navigate the EIDM ecosystem. Um, I want to, before we launch, make sure that you are comfortable with the fact that we're recording this meeting. My colleague Hannah will be recording if she hasn't already started. Thank you so much, Hannah. We'd also, before we, 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 um, uh, before we launch into presentations and introductions for today, is to learn a little bit about those of you that have joined us. So let's find out who's online. And if you can please go to mehdi.com, and Hannah's going to put this in the chat as well, and enter this code 6538-6902. Um, I can't see the chat while I'm presenting, so I'm going to assume that you have um, that in the chat link, and Hannah's sharing that with you. And it'll allow us to um, learn who's with us. So I'll give this a few minutes as you all fill out the poll. We've had two people um, answer so far. Nasreen, yes. I just want to let you know, um, Charles also wrote a comment in the chat that you are showing presenter view. So maybe you want, want to do that or maybe you don't. I just want to make you aware of it. Thank you. Um, that didn't happen when we tested this earlier. <laughs> Let me see how I can change that. Thank you so much. That's has, better. Has that changed? Okay, wonderful. Super, it looks like we've got quite a diversity of experiences on the on the call today. So this is going to be interesting. And for those of you that have stories to tell, I really hope that we have a little bit of time at the end of today to hear those stories and and also what insights and tips and tricks you can also share with us as as we navigate this um, this journey from from evidence to action. So for Taryn and Mark and Gubella, I hope this also gives you a sense of who our audience is for today and, and uh, making sure that we can kind of reflect on that as we're, we're sharing some of these, these stories of your own journeys as we're going, uh, going along. So we've had about uh, 25 responses and it looks like majority are, are just are still learning by doing, which is impressive that you're already on this journey. Um, many uh, sometimes are engaging, but would love to do more. Um, someone doesn't know where to start, so hopefully um, our, our panelists can assist with that a little bit. Same with those that are not quite sure how to engage effectively. 
So thank you so much for sharing with us who you are and a little bit of how um, we can tailor today's presentations and feedback for you. So in terms of the agenda for today, we have just less than an hour left. Um, I'll first do a few introductions. I was hoping I'd be able to put my, my video on so you can uh, see me, but I'll do that at the end because I can't uh, navigate back and forth between my presentation and, and the team's um, tabs. So bear with me on that, but I'll definitely introduce you to our esteemed panelists. Um, and also to our Department of Global Health here at Soundbosch University. Um, then we'll go into our presentations, but we will intersperse the presentations with some more polls to keep you engaged and on your toes um, and still with us. We'll obviously leave some time at the end for your questions, um, but also your stories. And we'll end off with a link to an evaluation of this webinar so that you can give us a, a, some feedback as we continue with these series over the next few months and how we can keep the things that are working and um, change the things that aren't. So thanks again to all those of you that have joined us. I see someone's unmuted. Is uh, did you want to anyone want to jump in and say something or can I continue? OK, it might be Joe's those uh, that have just joined us. For those of you that have just joined us, um, a warm welcome to all of you. Um, we've just started um, and uh, and I'm going to just give a quick overview on the Department of Global Health at Stellenbosch University. Um, even though this webinar is intended to cut across disciplines and we're really excited that it's part of Africa Evidence Week, um, it is embedded within the Department of Global Health. Um, and for those of you that are either directly or indirectly affiliated with the field of global health, just a quick overview on how we define it here at Stellenbosch. It's a field of scholarship and practice seeking to advance health equity by employing a transdisciplinary, intersectoral and collaborative approach, um, which I expect is similar across departments and across universities, but in particularly to ad address complex health and social problems that cross national borders and are impacted by transnational forces. Within the department, we have three divisions four centers and two institutes of which our um, panelists for today uh, come from. Um, we do encourage and hope to showcase stories across our students, postdocs and faculty um, and across disciplines as well. So I have the distinct pleasure of being your moderator for today. Um, our first panelists will be um, Professor Taryn Young, who is the director of the Center for Evidence-Based Healthcare and the head of the Division of Epidemiology at Biostatistics. She's also the executive director of the Department of Global Health, with her research focusing on summarizing and interpreting medical research. And she's been spearheading knowledge translation endeavors within as well as outside the department. Most recently, during the, during the COVID pandemic, she worked very closely with Mia Milan and Becky Sisa to train journalists in science journalism during the pandemic. And so she's going to focus her experiences today with us, as well as provide time for reflections on working with the media as a conduit to public advocacy. Our second panelist today is Prof. Mark Tomlinson, who's a professor at Stellenbosch as well and co-director of one of our institutes, the Institute of Life Course and Health Research. And his work focuses on factors that contribute to compromised maternal health um, and also mental health, understanding child and adolescent development in context of high adversity. Um, he's an activist who spends a considerable amount of time and effort trying to ensure research results reach key decision makers. And as you can see from his teaser here, it's going to be, it promises to be a very interesting um, talk on um, how engagement and advocacy actually makes conducting a uh, randomized control trial in five countries actually seem like a walk in the park. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and then our third panelist for today, is um, Prof. Gubelamji. She's a professor and director at uh, the Center for Disability and Rehab Studies at Stellenbosch. Um, she's the current chairperson and visionary behind the African Network for Evidence to Action 
in disability Afrinid. And some of her work involves issues of transformation and indigenous knowledge systems. Um, she recently published a book, um, The Walk Without Limbs, Searching for Indigenous Health Knowledge in Rural South Africa. And she's going to be sharing the important role of networks as a medium for advocacy on key issues such as disability rights. Thank you, uh, Taryn, Mark and Gubella for your time today. And I'm going to I'm going to hand over to Taryn at this point um, to to share with us her experiences on working with the media. Um, over to you, Taryn, and I will uh, stop sharing my screen. Uh, thanks, Nazreen. Um, so I just need to now get my uh, presentation up. Well, this is interesting new look. <laughs> um, how does one? OK, so I need to put this into into present them um, in slideshow. We can see your slide. Can you see the full slide from? Yes, we can. Yeah, we can. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. I was thrown a little bit by a new look. <laughs> um, I, I will keep my video off while I'm presenting for the sake of, of bandwidth. Um, so I'm, I'm sharing my experience um, in, in working with, with journalists and specifically linked to training um, journalists. Um, in, in knowledge translation and health, one often focuses on working with policymakers or guideline developers or focusing on uh, getting guidelines implemented. Uh, but policymakers and guideline developers and medical practitioners uh, in the health field are only some of the stakeholders that we need to be working with. Um, and the, the public um, and communities are essential because they are the ones that one would want to um, uh, get to use the best practice. Um, and often media is the, the key um, bridge between res the research world and the public. So in um, the past 18 months, um, we have all been affected um, by the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, this slide just illustrates how the caseload increased from January last year uh, to September this year. Um, and there's been um, millions and millions of cases and, and through the the response to the pandemic, many uh, different questions have been raised around how to prevent the infection, how to treat the infection and many more. Um, and through this um, response to the pandemic, there has been a major change in what's happening within the news landscape. Um, there's been an increased demand from everyone for reliable information uh, to, to help inform what needs to happen. Um, and, and that has not just been from the, the perspective of healthcare workers, but a, a massive increase from the public uh, to want to, to have information. Unfortunately, it's also created a, a, an environment for misinformation and fake news. Um, and, and the media and all journalists had to step up um, to be able to, to uh, provide this information. And it's not just science journalists, it's, not, it's the non-science or non-health journalists that had to start reporting on health issues. Um, without necessarily having the, the knowledge, the health knowledge uh, to be able to, to draw on um, or even the science background. And I was in the Department of Global Health and um, at the Center for Evidence-Based Healthcare 
we've been working to advance evidence-informed media reporting uh, for a number of years of uh, doing, uh, implementing various strategies. And today I'm sharing with you two uh, training initiatives that we collaboratively implemented. Um, the first one uh, that I'm mentioning here is a, a vaccine, vaccine science 101 course that we offered earlier this year um, to uh, journalists from many different countries who joined um, and we covered um, four sessions which included um, a, a, in essence an introductory uh, uh, aspects linked to vaccine science. Um, so it covered how do vaccines work, how, uh, how do we know whether it's safe, how do va vaccines get approved, how are vaccine programs implemented for example, uh, we had a whole session on variants and what they are and how they can impact on vaccine development and also vaccine procurement. Um, one uh, journalist who wrote a piece on this work afterwards said Africa-based journalists uh, who were reporting on COVID received the necessary shot in the arm in the form of this training program that was aimed at equipping them to report on COVID vaccines. Um, this course built on another one that we offered in last year. Uh, so both of these were offered collaboratively with uh, Mia Milan and colleagues from Becky Sisa. Um, and the EP 101 course uh, was led by uh, Professor Madhu Pai, um, also in collaboration with Becky Sisa um, and we uh, joined uh, in uh, um, to attend the session uh, and the EP 101 course was essentially to understand uh, the science behind the uh, the headlines a little bit better to be able to think critically um, and make sense of the different forms of research that were being reported. And this was a, a fantastic course in last year where 63 journalists from about 18 countries um, attended. Um, classes were offered in the evening over Zoom on a Monday and Thursday over a, a four week period. And it was brilliant that everybody was present um, in all of those sessions. So um, a short reflection on, on these. Um, I think it was great that we could offer this uh, as a collaborative initiative. Um, we shared the planning and the preparation and we used online spaces to the best of our abilities. Um, it strengthened relationships uh, for us in, in the groups that we were working with and it def definitely increased knowledge around these key concepts that we want to, to cover. Um, um, this, uh, the capacity building of journalists is just one aspect, however, linked to evidence informed media reporting and further action um, can be done in terms of fostering engagement between researchers and journalists, uh, building capacity and confidence of researchers to 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 share their findings with journalists uh, in, in an easy to understand manner um, and also ongoing um, building of trust as well as evaluation of the initiatives. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll pause there in terms of uh, setting the scene. Thank you, Nazreen. Super, Taryn. Thank you so much. And I'm sure that there's lots of questions that that uh, that that's going to prompt. Um, colleagues, please feel free to write your questions in the chat. And after all our presentations, we'll be able to direct them to the panelists for you, for whom you have questions, but you can begin those in the chat. Um, but I think it's really great to hear about the training and, and the, the role of the media. I think it'll be interesting to then learn how do researchers um, enhance their skills to be able to engage um, with these, these newly trained um, journalists, whether in science or not. Thank you so much, Taryn. 
Um, I'd like to welcome all those of you that have joined us in the last few minutes. Um, we're very happy to have you with us at this uh, at, in our webinar today. If we can ask those of you that have your videos on to please turn them off to um, assist with uh, preserving bandwidth, but we will have our panelists put their videos on at the end as they answer your questions. I'd like to hand the mic over to Prof. Mark Tomlinson to speak to us about um, his journey, particularly engaging with the government. I won't give too much of it away. Um, I think his teaser here is uh, is really got us on um, on tenter hooks. So over over to you, Mark, um, to talk to us about how engagement in advocacy makes conducting a randomized controlled trial uh, seem like a walk in the park. I'm very intrigued. Over to you. Thanks so much, Nazreen. Can you hear me and see the slides? We can. Thank you. Thanks, and 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 thanks everyone for the opportunity. Um, what I'm going to do is is uh, make a few comments about how I understand engagement and advocacy in this presentation. Briefly talk to a couple of studies that that uh, you know our team has been involved in for many years now, and link that to to the issues of, of, of engagement and, and advocacies, advocacy. So I want to start with sort of those of you, most of you probably are in universities. They're, they're very odd places. You go and you study for, you know, eight years, nine years, you get PhDs, medical training, um, and then you end up with a job in, a, in, a, in many university departments doing things that, uh, for example, like uh, managing, like running a research project, for example, that you had absolutely no training in, um, absolutely no qualifications in, and you have to kind of just sort of run with it and, and learn on the, the job. Um, I think there's there's obviously pluses and minuses about that. But for me, equivalent, you know, an equivalent thing is then is is for example, knowledge management, knowledge translation, engagement advocacy, research uptake, there are any number of words to to describe it. But but for, for most of the time for people like, you know, for 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 myself, for example, um, when I first started, these were not not issues that that uh, that I had much to do with that I even heard of, let alone being trained for. So a lot of what I'm going to say is is just sort of was learned sort of in, in many ways winging it across the years. And I want to start with a brief story from a project I was involved in for many years called Prime. And it had a big research uptake component of it. And at one of the meetings, it was there were five countries, and one of the country teams was from Ethiopia. And we were at a meeting, if I remember, it was in India, and the Ministry of Health representative, and the, the thing about, and this is one of the lessons about engagement advocacy, is one of the strengths, many strengths of Prime, was that the, 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 the funder demanded that the Ministry of Health representatives were part of the project from inception. And when I say inception, at the, level, at the time of writing the proposal. So all the five countries had Ministry of Health representatives from the start. And the project was a, it ended up being about a seven year project. And at one of the meetings in India, the, the Ministry of Health representative from Ethiopia um, was asked a question about policy briefs as a method of engaging of kind of research uptake. And he said, no, no, please, you know, I strongly recommend that you send me your policy briefs. I love policy briefs. And he said, in fact, if I get about another five policy briefs, I will have a pile that's high enough for me to put my coffee on next to my desk. So please do send them. And then he went on to explain that he gets so many and that if he doesn't have some kind of a mechanism, a meeting where the policy brief is going to be, be sort of launched, if he doesn't have a relationship with the researchers that have, been, that have been ongoing, where they trust one another and they're building towards something, he is just going to largely use them, not because he doesn't, not because he doesn't want to read them, but because he simply doesn't have the time. He's going to use them as a table for, for his coffee. So briefly, the two sort of two studies I want to talk about are two uh, long-term longitudinal studies. Uh, the one's been going on. Both of them started um, during pregnancy, recruiting pregnant women, who were then both randomised control trials. Um, um, where half the, the caregivers received an intervention and half didn't. And, and one we followed now for close to 20 years and the, and the other for basically close, close to 10 years. Um, and so I'm not going to go into the details of the study, but just bearing in mind how the long-term nature of some of, of those studies and the data that's coming out of them, just hold that in your mind as I, as I, as I talk. 
So I've touched on this. I, for me, I think the, 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 the most fundamental building block of any engagement advocacy is building with the relationships with the people that you, that you want to convince of something down the line. Um, if you send an, an email to a policymaker, to a government uh, minister, to a district manager with a policy brief, please use my research, the likelihood of them seeing it are small, the likelihood of them even reading it, reading it or even, even less. So one has to build these relationships in order to set up a fertile ground for then being able to convince people that your data, your research is meaningful. And one of the ways it's meaningful is if you've got a relationship and you've established that it's meaningful to that person. Because what we as researchers often, we think our research, all of us think our research is utterly wonderful. Um, and we think it's the best research ever. It's a bit like having your, your bit, bit like having children. Everyone thinks their child's the most intelligent child in the world. Um, now, you know, for a policymaker, they've got access to potentially all the research being done in the country. Um, you have to, you have to, you have to get in there in another kind of way. It can't just be because you think what you do is is interesting. You you have to take a long term view. You know. Some research, some actions, I mean, what Taryn so, so wonderfully described now is when you're training a group of journalists to think about how to translate data into something that's going to be understandable by members of the public, by a policymaker. Um, there's research, for example, like research a trial into, um, into the, the J&J vaccine. Um, one, and I'm not talking about here about convincing anti-vaxxers to take it, but there's, there's no research uptake really necessary there. You show that a vaccine's effective against COVID, it, you, they, you, you've got it. You, you, you know, there, so there's, there's, certain research, uh, there's certain research which has a very quick response time and you actually have to do very little engagement and advocacy. The type of research I've been engaged in, you really do have to take a long-term view and know that you're going to have to build evidence Randomized control trial evidence takes takes about you know three to five years to even get the the, the 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 barest amount of evidence that you need. And if you want to then show that your impacts last for another five years in terms of child and adolescent development across the life course, it's even longer. So so for certain types of research, and you've got to know when where your research fits in this. You've got to build those relationships and know that you may be you may have little impact initially but there's a long-term, there's a potential long-term view. It's, those of you who've ever heard of an elevator pitch, um, this is the idea that if you've, if you've got a research finding, make sure that you've got in your mind a one to two minute pitch of that, of that, of the results and what they might mean, because you never know when you're gonna be in an elevator with a policymaker. So make sure you've got it in your head and don't lose that opportunity. So windows of opportunity are really, really important. So the elevator pitch is one idea, is one place where it can happen. But equally, and this is what, what happened with a lot of the research that I've been doing, is that we were doing work in improving early child development, you know, from over 20 years ago. Um, there, there wasn't much of a movement globally for that. When the global strategy for women and children's health came up, um, and other opportunities, then all of a sudden there was this context in which research could could now be heard, and it was saying we had the data now. Now quickly jump in um, and and do that because you aren't always going to have a very quick win. Like if you if you develop a vaccine, you might have to have that long term view, and you're going to have to wait for the elevator or wait for that for that opportunity to. Um, to sort of jump in and say, here's my research. And in terms of our research, you know, we've, 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 we've been very successful in getting our data from these two studies into a number of initiatives within the Western Cape government. Um, it's been used um, in World Health Organization guidelines for early child development um, and is, is currently being, is part of a, of a, of a global parenting initiative um, and uh, part of something called Parenting for Lifelong Health, which is around getting par evidence-based parenting programs into, into countries globally. Now, if you told me 20 years ago that that's what I, I was aiming for now, I, I wouldn't have had a sense of that. But it was a, a commitment to getting good evidence, staying the course of a, of a marathon and not a sprint, um, and waiting for those windows of opportunity and building, building those relationships. Thanks, everyone.
Thanks so much, Mark. So many key nuggets there in terms of, you know, the uh, keeping the long term view. And I love the the analogy of a marathon, not a sprint. Um, when we come back to the questions, perhaps one thing to be mulling on is, is, you know, how do you project 20 years down the road and how do you how do you strategically think about building important relationships and, and, and engaging with stakeholders and, and having them be part of the marathon um, when there's sometimes uh, change, um, change within organizations and governments um, while you're building these relationships? And I suspect that'll be a question that might be helpful to, to all our panelists. Um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to take us back to um, uh, where can I find this? Back to the polls, um, and hope that you can see my screen here. Hello, no, Alex. Just a second. Uh, no, that's not what I want to share. Mama. Uh, is someone trying to speak? Just a second. Here we are. Okay. So I have another question for all of you, and uh, if you can go back to the mentee link, um, it's going to ask you based on what you've heard from Taryn so far and Mark, and we'll come to Gubella in a minute. But as a researcher, for those of you who are researchers, what worries you the most about engaging with stakeholders? Now, if you have uh, more than one word that you're trying to put in there, just put a hyphen between the two words, otherwise they'll get separated. But I'll give you a few minutes to, to put in, and Hannah, if you can put the link again for everyone, um, but you can go to menti.com and put in the code at the top of the slide, 65386902, and just let us know what worries you the most. Um, and a few things are coming up here already. Um, access to stakeholders, the time to do this, and I think that's an interesting aspect as well, because I think as we think about um, students, postdocs, researchers or faculty in universities, there's always a question about how does the university support and uh, incentivize um, uh, researchers and faculty to be able to engage with stakeholders. So I see that's uh, pa the power imbalance, I'd love for somebody to tell us um, what you mean by power imbalance. Um, compromising your integrity, the relevance, funding, also very important things. It's super, we've got already 14 people that have put in your thoughts. I encourage many more of you uh, to do that. As you're doing that, can I ask the person, if you don't mind losing your anonymity, to unmute and, and say a little bit more about your concerns about power imbalances? Would someone like to unmute and share with us about power imbalance and why that's a concern? Hello, Nasreen, can you hear go? Me? Yes, Kirsten, go ahead. Yes, hi, this is Kirsten from LMU in Germany. I wrote the power imbalance because um, I find it an interesting aspect to see that the policymaker um, as a decision maker often has higher power and basically making sure that this person does not compromise my research um, is something that um, I find interesting that should be considered. Thanks. Super, thanks for sharing and thank you also for introducing yourself. Um, I, I find also the compromising my integrity. Go ahead. Did someone else want to chip in on that? Please introduce yourself and go ahead. Hello. OK. Um, does someone want to speak about the, the compromising of integrity um, and why that's a concern when engaging with stakeholders? Feel free to just unmute yourself and let us know um, why that's uh, a concern. Hi Nasreen, this is Lisa speaking also from the LMU in Germany. <laughs> I put in the Hello, compromising. Lisa. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi. 
um, compromising my integrity. Um, I think that is something uh, which um, uh, everybody who um, interacted with stakeholders at some point um, experienced at least the feeling of um, being potentially um, working for someone else's agenda and um, doing things which um, might compromise the integrity of your research by um, ch making changes to your methods, for example, or um, changes to your sam sample, very like small actions that might have an impact on um, at least the feeling you have on your own integrity of doing research. At least that's a feeling I had in some cases. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I and I encourage our panelists in the Q&A later to see if um, you can respond or address to some of these concerns and how you overcame them as you were engaging with your stakeholders. So Taryn, Mark and Gubella, you will be um, uh, you will be tapped to to respond to some of these in the Q&A, so keep that in mind. I'm going to try and pick one more of these before we go to Gubella's presentation. Um, and and I'm just instrumental instrumentalization. I that's I'm very curious about that one. All of these are really interesting. But would would whoever who mentioned that like to share your concerns about the instrumentalization of research um, when engaging with stakeholders? Um, again, Lisa. Sorry, that was also me. <laughs> and this sorry, is really Lisa. <laughs> Just based on a recent example where we've been working or like very closely engaging with policymakers and um, kind of been taken up by their agenda. So I think both of them kind of correlate for me the first um, compromising one one's integrity as a researcher, but also then having the feeling of being um, instrumentalized for purposes um, that might not be very obvious for you in the first place. Mm. Um, and also I think that could lead to potentially the feeling, you know, of not, um, you know, that there might be a power um, imbalance uh, at some point between researchers and policymakers. These are really fascinating insights. Thank you. So I'm going to pick one more and I'm going to cross my fingers. It wasn't Lisa or Kirsten. <laughs> Capacity. Um, who who, who um, mentioned the concern about capacity or skills to be able to engage with stakeholders? And would you like to share a bit more about that? Is there someone that wants to speak about capacity? You can unmute yourself. Okay, so whoever mentioned capacity isn't isn't quite keen to be unanonymized, which is which is perfectly fine. Um, but I think we have several ideas here about what sometimes makes this this journey. Um, uh, you know, in, in, for some treacherous, for some extremely apprehensive um, uh, to be able to navigate. And I'm hoping that our presenters today, but also the rest of our series will help to unpack some of these, but also understand how colleagues have overcome some of these really veritable challenges. So thank you so much for the 27 people that have answered this particular question. Um, I'm going to um, now uh, request that uh, Professor Gubelamji um, shares with us her experience of overcoming some of these challenges through the creation of a network and a network that's particularly focused on um, evidence informed disability rights. Um, over to you Gubella. The, the, uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and allow you to share yours. We can see your screen. You just have to put it in presenter mode, I think, and then you can you can start. And just unmute yourself, Prof, so we can hear you.
Okay, can can everybody see my presentation? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. Um, today I am going to uh, speak about the African Network for Evidence to Action in Disability, a, a Pan-African Network for Advocating for Evidence-Informed Disability Rights. Um, how the network evolved, um, there was a space and time whereby uh, within the Center for Disability and Rehabilitation Studies, uh, which is based at Stellenbosch University, we felt that there is limited research evidence on disability within the African region. And this uh, was brought by the fact that we have got uh, students uh, both from the region as well as from international perspective. And when we dialogue with them about disability research and disability policies, we had that sense that there is actually a need to explore this area of a disability research, as well as how this research is translated into a policies. We also had a, a bit of concern with regard to whether the evidence itself does make impact on the lives of persons with disability at ground level. And we're also starting to question ourselves with regard to the evidence itself, whether it is a good evidence and good methodologies we use to actually bring out the evidence. And ultimately, whether policymakers were actually picking up this evidence to influence policy and change for persons with disabilities. So then we uh, aimed, we sat in a, within the center and discuss uh, the possibility of developing this network. And we, we felt that we will ultimately um, have a, be a significant contributor and a facilitator around disability research evidence within the region and focus on how do we translate disability research that is there and available uh, into policy and into practice. How do we bring many stakeholders that actually participate in disability research uh, into a round table to actually talk about disability research and its translation and to also develop uh, disability products. I hear uh, from Mark that policy br briefs are not very important, but what are other products which one could utilize to ensure that this translation happens? And to ensure that there is continuous engagement within the region around disability research, and where possible, we can share with other researchers uh, best evidence that is there, including a uh, guidelines that can actually drive this evidence and to also co coordinate in country now because this is a re we decided to create a regional network and we felt that each country should actually have its own round table um, discussion in terms of what disability research is available in its own country where are the gaps and how can they work step by step to actually um, uh, create more evidence to address those gaps. And then we also felt that now this grouping of people, regional people, we need to really in three year uh, uh, process or time, we need to meet in a conference and then share where we are. So then how did we get, uh, go step by step in terms of uh, developing the network? It was not easy. We first consulted the university management to ensure that the network is aligned with strategies within the university. Then we also identified within the university other stakeholders, other units and departments that were already engaged in disability research. 
we also drew from stakeholders that were outside. So there's already a sense from disabled people that researchers are always researching us and we are never involved in disability research. So our aim was to ensure that uh, disabled people's organizations were also involved in, in the early stages of developing this network, including uh, provincial and national government departments, regional and international partners, and national, regional, and international academic institutions. Then what progress has the network made? Um, Afrinid uh, already have got um, an office, I would say, within Stellenbosch University, a secretariat. So it is known that Stellenbosch University have got this disability network, which really is based at Stellenbosch. So people then can link Stellenbosch University with actually this network and consult uh, with um, the network uh, via Stellenbosch University. We also have got a governing structure and a governing board that really gives guidance uh, to the network. The network have got about 400 delegates. We link with the delegates via a quarterly newsletter we have got an, a, a website, uh, as you can see. We also continue to have a triannual conferences, which are linked to one of the key policy dis disability policies. And we also have got um, these disability research country working groups. That means within countries themselves that are linked to AFRINEED, they already have started discussing disability research within their own countries. There are more than 20 countries regionally that are linked to AFRINIT international. There are more than seven countries that are linked uh, to AFRINIT and everybody then that is participating in AFRINIT, then they are engaging in this whole concept of how do we develop disability evidence and how do we manage a disability evidence that it makes impact on the lives of persons with a disability. So then what has been the outcome of the network? Generally, there had been an enhanced collaboration between academic units dealing with disability research at Stellenbosch University. Um, these, uh, we already know who are the people that are really fully engaged in disability research within the university itself. Already we have uh, presented uh, six triannual conferences starting from 2007, two in Cape Town, 2007 and 2009, one in Zimbabwe, one in Malawi, one in um, Ghana, and now we are coming, we are back again uh, within the Western Cape and we tapered one in 2020. We also have strengthened the relationships between Stellenbosch University and disabled people's organizations. We have managed to identify clusters of disability researchers and, and, dis and disability research projects which then make it quite easy in terms of identifying people who really can lead a disability research. We now have got also an African Journal of Disability, which really is a, a very a good journal and registered with PubMed and Scopus and other um, academic indicators. We also have got available frameworks for inclusion of disability issues in regional policies. Um, thank you, colleagues. Thank you so much, Gubela. And it's amazing to see 
the variety of stakeholders that you've had to engage with to be able to move Afrineed forward, um, but also the importance of bringing along the university. Um, and I think uh, Mark also mentioned the importance of um, ensuring that the university is aware of some of these engagements and that you you lean on on some of that support to be able to advance some of your engagements, particularly if embedded within a university. So we have about seven minutes. Um, to go and we would love to um, have our panelists please put on your videos and field some questions from our um, from our audience and and for our colleagues that are attending we would love to hear from you what more would you like to hear about these evidence to action journeys um, what would help you in your own evidence to action journey that the panelists could provide insight on or, or, or do you have your own stories that you'd like to share? And are there any other questions? You're welcome to unmute yourself, introduce yourself and ask your question or paste it in the chat and I will um, read it out for you to our panelists. So if I can ask, um, we can see Taryn and Mark. Um, uh, Gubella, if you can put your video on. Um, this is the only time our attendees get to see who you are um, and, and we'll get a chance for your questions. So um, would anyone like to kick off the questions? Otherwise, I have a couple that I will uh, in the last couple of minutes that we have. Feel free to just unmute and, and ask a question. Hi, may I ask a question? It's of Ashraf course. Kaji speaking. Please go ahead. Um, I, yes, thank you. I, I very much enjoyed the presentations. Um, I'm listening to this uh, seminar as, a, as a, a person who works with students, who works with masters and doctoral students. Um, and often uh, the research questions are driven by intellectual curiosity, not necessarily with a view to making an impact on policy. Um, so I think there's 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 perhaps a, a sometimes a misalignment or mismatch between what is intellectually interesting, uh, what is theoretically uh, um, of of interest to the student and to also to myself as a, as a supervisor of of doctoral and master students and also honor students, and then what is useful to society, um, and and the two don't necessarily uh, um, meet each other. I just wonder what the thoughts are of, of the panelists on this matter. Super, thank you. Go ahead. Not sure who wants to go first, Mark. And then... I was hoping Taryn or Bella would go first. <laughs> uh, I, Sorry, I, I picked I... on you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can have a stab at it. Um, you know, I, I mean, yeah, Ashraf, thanks for the question. And, you know, I think there, there are lots of research questions that are, uh, you know, about intellectual curiosity. And it's not for me or anybody else to say that's less valuable or whatever, you know. And, and I think if that is the case, then, you know, that's interesting. And that's what, you know, and then that's, you know, that's, that's not what is going to to change policy. Some people aren't interested in that, you know. Um, but I think if you're working, in a field where that is important to you, where your uh, your performance appraisal is going to be linked to that in some way or another, then I think it is incumbent upon us to then go and, for example, do Nazreen's fantastic course on knowledge to action to try and learn about how to how to do this, to be thinking of building the relationships, um, and. And you know, and the reality is, is is you know, there's no one metric that's going to be that's going to be appropriate for for everybody. And I like to believe that the people doing the research for intellectual curiosity that don't have an immediate link to policy or a link to to societal change necessarily, that may not be apparent, but actually, you know, it's feeding in some way into the bigger picture, and it's helping maybe the people where that. Is a, there is more of a direct link or actually reading it and it does have a role. But I, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think everyone can be held to the, the same metric. I don't think. Yeah, no. thanks. 
And maybe I can just uh, pick up from uh, Mark's comment. Uh, uh, I think uh, for students, it's a it's a brilliant opportunity to be thinking through how they can communicate the findings of their research beyond uh, the publication. Because often with with postgraduates, one would want them to pass. So there's the thesis or dissertation that comes out of it, and then we encourage them to uh, publish their research. And it's a, it's a useful exercise to think through based on the question and based on the research that they've done, how or do they want to communicate it further beyond publication and how that can be tailored for different mm. audiences. And, and that's a useful uh, mechanism for building capacity or starting to build capacity to think through um, uh, knowledge translation and other strategies. Yes, and I also would like to come in uh, and say that uh, from our unit, a majority of uh, our postgraduate students are already working within the um, disability or health field, whereby uh, these policies are critical important. So most of the time, by the time they register with us, they have got a loose research question in their mind, which is something that have been troubling them uh, at ground level in terms of how, how things are happening, how services are being um, uh, implemented. And so then they will come already with a, a research question which they want to uh, explore. And we also, two in our unit uh, encourage applied um, research so that at the end of the day yes though we wouldn't discourage anyone who comes with a, a very innovative idea um, which really is not uh, related to applied research but uh, as i say a majority of our students are coming with more practical related research uh, questions that they really want to answer and also influence policy and practice super thank you and i think we have time we're out of time but we have mm -hmm. one more question here that it would be nice for us to to respond to i think it was a name it came up in all these presentations is how can we foster good relationships between researchers and policymakers in rolling out cross-country evidence and this is for Mark and Gubella, but of course, Taryn, you're welcome to jump in as well. Can, I mean, I was, you know, when I read the question, my immediate thought was we often talk about, for example, we need to build capacity in adolescence or we need to create the for, for adolescence. You know, the reality is I don't I don't I'm not sure you can you can foster that. You have to just go out and build those relationships. You have to build a trusting relationship. Academics and researchers can be profoundly arrogant. They think the research is everything. They've got the, the, the truth now about something and they don't. And they often don't know the reality on the ground. And so if you go in like that, nothing's gonna be fostered. But if you can engage in a, in a dialogue and build a relationship of trust and mutual respect, that's how you do it over time. I don't think it's something you can like magically conjure up or produce from the top down or from the academy down. I don't, I don't think it works like that because a lot of the time the language you've been mm. using is just isn't understood by anybody outside of our, the person in the office next door. So we, we've got to yeah. do a lot of the hard work, I think. Yeah, uh, I would agree with Mark in, in terms of that it's actually quite hard work. I can just remember with AFRINIT, the very first conference in 2007, it was the first time that disabled people's organizations, disabled people, and then academics were all under one roof in a conference. And it was so conflicting and uh, persons with disabilities were very upset towards academics. And they felt that academics, they really are not listening and are not responsive. On the other hand, the academics were overwhelmed because they thought that there's some good work that they are doing. It really took a long time for all stakeholders to really uh, come together and to really understand uh, some of the pressures that academics are under, as well as 
to also academics to listen and be more receptive to some of the concerns that persons with disabilities have. So it's actually that give and take type of relationship, but it actually takes quite a long time to, to, uh, to form and, and gel together. Super turn, did you want to add anything? Um, no, Nazreen, I, I think I've, uh, did, did, I mean, we, we implemented the project a while back, the Policy Buddies project, we, which in brief is a, was a project where we linked uh, somebody from our research team with a, a policy maker for them purely to build a relationship um, and for that then to be the, the foundation onto which there would be increased demand for evidence, for research evidence, and that the researcher will be able to respond to that. Um, and, and the whole premise of the budding system was truly being building friendships um, and relationships and trust. Um, and, and not, uh, for example, a mentorship relationship where there's a, a power dynamic. Um, so I can I can share that link uh, to some of the, the reports that we have on policy bodies if anybody's interested. I think that would be great, Taryn. And Gubella, there's also questions about whether the network formation and disability research has been published as lessons. And if you can uh, paste the link to that, um, that would be great as well. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. Mm -hmm. um, I just uh, I want to say thank you to everybody. I'm, this is me <laughs> uh, for joining us today. Um, it's uh, been great to have you all with us. I'm sorry that we couldn't hear about these other stories that were mentioned earlier, but we will be doing these webinars us frequently. Um, we have you on our email list and you're welcome to join us for future webinars. Um, you're welcome to be panelists on future webinars um, and help us navigate um, particularly how we can build capacity, skills, confidence in young upcoming researchers and faculty who are starting to navigate particularly this important uh, place in the research continuum of evidence to policy and practice. So um, Hannah has kindly put a link for us in the chat mm -hmm. for the evaluation form. If we can please ask you to fill that out, it takes less than three minutes. Um, and also to wish you all a wonderful rest of your day. Um, and thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of Africa Evidence Week. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye.